Hi, hello, welcome. If you are new here, I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. Today's case, you might remember from, if you're a Netflix doc person, you will remember it from Don't Fuck With Cats. This is actually one of the first true crime cases I ever covered four years ago. Wild to think. But it didn't stay up long because I changed my format and how I shared these stories really quickly. But this case has stuck to me so much. I, I have always wanted to talk about it and it still remain on my channel. So here we are. Um, before we get started, a little caution. The following video contains a lot of graphic description, although you know me and I'm going to try to keep it as least graphic. Um as possible but there is definite like animal cruelty not cruelty like killing dismemberment of a body if any of that is a trigger for you you can catch me in the next video no judgment here I feel like a lot of people remember this case especially Canadians because um it garnished a lot of attention in Canada not just when Netflix released something but this also went worldwide because not only the severity, but it, it expanded worldwide. It affected a lot of people in different areas of the world. What I didn't realize until watching the documentary, though, of, was how much had happened behind the scenes involving internet sleuths, like I think a lot of us kind of feel like we are sometimes when we like dissect cases and they were within a Facebook group. They actually were interacting with a murderer before he became a murderer but knew he was going to become a murderer okay I'm not going to go too deep into the the way that it was um outlined in the documentary don't fuck with cats because there's a documentary that you can watch but I do like we'll trickle a little bit in there so that you can kind of see like how things were um a lot um or I guess let's not say um 12 million times Sherilyn unfolding behind the scenes because it's so unfortunate so frustrating you just want to scream that you wished somebody had taken these individuals within this Facebook group seriously but I can also appreciate in the same sense how just hearing that from maybe law enforcement you'd be like oh you're you're an internet sleuth okay it could you know you wouldn't hold as much weight to it anyways I, I shouldn't be making excuses it's a it's it's really unfortunate it just makes you want to freak out because I truly believe if they were taken more seriously this case would have been completely different now to learn a little bit about this case we are going to have to understand a bit about the man monster behind it Luca Magnata Luca Magnata was not actually born Luca. He was born Eric Clinton Kirk Newman. He was born in Scarborough, Ontario on July 24th, 1982 to his mother, Anna, and his father, Douglas, and had three siblings. Unfortunately, his father suffered with mental health issues and that ultimately led to the dissolve of his and Anna's marriage when Luca was around 10 years years old from what i read his mother was extremely ocd and not just in terms of where you're just thinking of obsessive compulsive with um you know cleaning or organization but even control of the children like everything needed needed her control her approval kind of she had to know where they were at all times she homeschooled them she didn't let them interact with other children they were basically on lockdown with her all the time and then according to the kids I, it, it almost sounds like there was definitely some not just OCD issues going on there but some other mental health issues with in with their mother as well because they alleged that there would also be times where she would just randomly like lock them outside of the house and they would be in the yard. Luca claimed that she even locked a family rabbit outside for a long period of time and it was too cold for this rabbit to be outside so it did not make it. Really the only person that Luca spent time with outside of his mom and siblings was his grandmother. Her name was Phyllis and besides grandma Phyllis he really didn't have any friends. So he 
pretty much kept to himself. And one of the main things that he would escape to was just watching movies to entertain himself. It wasn't until high school that Luca was able to go to school. So he went to high school and it was a very, it's described as a very awkward situation. He didn't know how to socialize and I read reports that that caused him to be bullied and beat up quite a bit. And this is kind of where he starts to lead into the path of self-destruction, breaking the law in instead of, you know, trying to make better of a, a crap situation. I think there's a lot of people out there who have had similar experiences in life and it sucks. It's terrible, but it's not an excuse to become a criminal or do terrible things. And that's kind of what Luca decided to do with his pain. In 2005, that is when he got his first charge. It was for impersonating a woman by applying for credit cards and buying a bunch of things under this woman's name. So like, he committed fraud. And a year after that is when he officially rebranded himself. So up until this point, he was going by his birth name. And then he legally changed his name to Luca Rocco Magnata, which it's like a, it, that is a statement name right there. You can kind of tell the plan in his mind was to be memorable. He wanted a catchy, catchy name. And I don't think at the time, even though he was, you know, partaking in criminal activity that he was wanting to be known for what he is now known for, but he definitely wanted to make his mark on the world. He had gone on several auditions for reality television shows. He had also appeared in a couple X-rated films. Looking through kind of the timelines, it seems like this name change allowed him to take on this completely new persona in his mind. And it was a star. Luca was in his mind, this name was going to make him a star. He would post videos of himself like photos almost compilations of him on YouTube which is fine but he would create them under aliases so it would seem like these were fan accounts that were making these videos on his behalf and just like obsessing over him he would also go into forums and talk about him as some like as a, a fan so he'd be like talking about himself but as a fan and while these fan accounts are being created and he's talking and drumming up some attention about himself in in these forums he also starts a rumor about himself and the rumor is that he's dating Carla Homolka. I guess this is a good indicator of kind of like where where the thought process it was of just why the hell would you even want to associate yourself with someone like that if you don't know who Carla Homolka is. She is the scum of Canada. She's like the most hated woman in Canada. Her and her piece of garbage husband Paul Bernardo are notorious serial killers. One of their victims was actually Carla's sister. I covered this case. Huge disclaimer for that one. That case actually was one of the first cases where I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can keep making videos. It That did a number on me. It's it's really, really hard to watch. Um, that being said, one of the worst things on top of that about Carla Homoka is that she's no longer in prison. So she just freely roams like our beautiful country, which is aggravating because I just feel like she doesn't have any right to just touch anybody's soil, let alone Canadian soil, but she's human garbage. So there's a rumor that Luca and Carla are in this relationship and he reaches out to the news to do an interview about the situation saying that he doesn't know who started this rumor and it's destroying his life. And it's all because of this whole rumor of you dating Carl Hamaka. That's This is the thing that's... The rumors destroyed my life, basically, and... Um... I've been receiving death threats. My address is posted, that's why I had to move. Uh, I want my Pomeranian back. It was taken out of my SUV. I, I'm about to have a nervous breakdown here. My reputation is completely ruined. Um, I just uh, want everybody to set, I want to set the record straight that um, me and her have absolutely no connection. 
we know now he was the one who started the rumor. So to be on that level of, I, I feel comfortable saying insanity. Like, it's unfathomable. Like, I don't understand the, th- like, the thought process because it's okay to revamp, okay? If you made some poor decisions in life, you, you got you got charged with fraud, you did a name change to revamp and you're auditioning for reality television, you want to be on reality television or you want to, you want to be in X-rated films, that's your prerogative. That's that you do you. I feel like if he could have just like kept that up, there probably would have been an opportunity for him to be like the kooky character on a reality television show. But this itself, like associating yourself with such trash, like Carla Homoka and the case there, I don't know. It just it's is an indication, I guess, of maybe just the fact that th- there is there are people who are just like born pure evil. And I say that because starting a rumor that you are in a relationship with Carla Homoka, like that's just the tip of the monstrosity that is Luca Magnata. So in 2010, a video comes out. I personally have never been able to bring myself to watch it, nor do I even want to. On the documentary, don't fuck with cats. I I know that there are clips of it. And I was when I was watching the documentary, like I saw that like the video was starting and I thought it was just going to kind of be like, you know, just like pieces of a thumbnail. But the footage just kind of kept rolling. And I was like, I there is no way that I'm going to test the waters to see how much of this they show. So I didn't. I can't tell you how much is shown on the documentary if you are somebody who watched it and you know the scene I'm about to talk about right now maybe leave it in the comments so people can um know but yeah just ease yourself with caution if you don't see anything in the comments but they do share in detail what is happening within this video so this is your warning right now if you're a huge animal lover you might want to start fast forwarding at this point basically this video that is posted on I was gonna say like I can't talk and saying like poisted because I'm so flabbergasted right now and affected by what I'm going to talk about but no we if you've been here forever you know I just don't know how to talk okay basically this video is of two little kittens they are on a bed and you see like this this hand come into frame and is kind of playing with the kittens kind of like I don't know enticing them teasing them playing with them like the kittens are like oh great we're playing right now and then you ugh, I'm gonna just like throw up thinking about this and then you see this plastic clear bag come into the frame and realize that this monster is going to put the kittens in the bag and does so and then you hear a vacuum cleaner turn on and he attaches the vacuum to the bag and it's pretty self-explanatory what happens and this is all recorded okay after that this person takes out the kittens so that there is no question what actually transpired like it was obvious the kittens were no longer alive so this is posted online and oftentimes when things this like this is not uncommon which is actually sick there's a lot of horrendous things that get posted online and there's a huge response a lot of people rightfully so get extremely angry they get upset they want to get involved but eventually what ends up happening is there the you kind of get some momentum and then and then your steam rolls out if you're not getting you know the help or the people backing up and the resources that you need and it just kind of gets left at that so with this with this case with this video there's a Facebook group that is created and the mission is to find out who did it to these little kittens. And these members go full blown detective mode. You got to see it all unfold in the documentary. That's the premise of it. So like I said, I'm not going to get too much into it because that's what the documentary is. It's crazy. Like you're on, you're on the edge of your seat forgetting that this is actually real life and the emotions you go through are wild. You're just like, kind of inspired and like wow like you're so you guys are so smart I can't believe you did that you should be detectives in real life and then you think it's just like a a fictional movie and then you're like oh no this isn't this is nonfiction. and then you get furious alongside of them anyways so what happens is 
they're dissecting this video, which I cannot even believe, like, imagine how traumatizing that would have been for them to have, like, force themselves to watch it with the end goal of being like, okay, like, we have to subject ourselves to this because we are going to catch this mother effer. So they're, they're looking at this video, dissecting pieces, and they end up finding out, like, through the video that they're, like, the, the way the room is set up is how it would be set up in like certain countries and places. And they're talking about this in this group. And then they start getting these tips and these clues from ghost accounts that are in the group. And it's not before long that they realize they're now being toyed with and that whoever is the person on this video that they're all talking amongst themselves about has infiltrated the group. What happens though is one of these members gets a private tip that the person that they're looking for is Luca Magnata. At this point, he is not, you know, this this known name that he thought or wanted to be. So the name means absolutely no, nothing to anybody. And they Google Luca Magnata. And then that's when they see like all these fan accounts that have popped up and they see what he looks like. And looking at his side profile and the side profile of the individual in the video with the kittens, they feel like it looks very similar and start to just like zero in on him. Now, something to mention is they didn't want to make too many rash decisions because there had already been a really huge lynch mob of people that had gone to this group to try to find out what was going on. And they had already accused somebody else of being the person in that video and it actually wasn't that person and that individual took their life. I'm not sure if it had anything to do with the accusations, but um, a lot of that person's friends said that this individual suffered a lot from depression. Um, but I mean, like there's no way of knowing, obviously, if somebody was already low and suffering from depression and then you are essentially getting burned at the stake and being accused of doing something that horrific, it's not going to put you in a good, a better spot. So there's like key members of this group who were the ones that were privy to this information. And they were like, okay, let's start a new group so that we can theorize on the sidelines and not um, have, you know, all of these other people within the mix just jumping on something, which I think is so responsible, especially in today's world of social media like this didn't happen too too long ago but there was no tiktok or anything like that by then and i oh, like <laughs> oh my gosh you guys know i have a love hate relationship with tiktok but yeah <laughs> i'm just gonna leave it at that i guess i just there are a lot of like outlandish accusations and claims and it just helps nobody and i'm not saying like i'm not picking specifically on TikTok, but it happens. I see it way more there. I do find that, you know, there are really great creators on there who, who are ethical and they take their time to properly research things, you know, use protective language, not just send a bunch of people out there for blood. And then there you are on the also complete opposite spectrum on the same app where people will just talk and not understand that your words hold weight. And when you're talking about things like true crime, you, you got to be pre pretty confident and pretty sure in what you're saying because you're talking about real people. So moving forward, I, I just, I thought that that was really, I thought that was really respectful, smart, ethical, all good things to go off on the side and just be like, okay, before before we jump to conclusions, let's let's make sure. So through the fans, the air quote, heavy air quote, guys, for any listeners, through the fan site images of Luca, they are able to discover the coordinates of one of the locations of a photo that's posted. And they track him down to Toronto, Canada. And they weren't just able to track him down to Toronto. Like they were able to track the apartment building that he was living in. They contacted the Toronto police and they were like, we know this is the guy that did this. This is the apartment. Go there. Check it out. And the police did take this claim seriously. They went. Unfortunately, by the time they got to the building, he was no longer living at the apartment. 
talking to the building manager was able to say, yes, the per- that person did live here. So that's got to be extremely frustrating, but also rewarding for, you know, the Facebook group detectives. I'm giving them the name because like that was you were they did detective work. OK, but how validating to be like, wow, like that was true. We did it. And then the police go there and they're like, so you were right, but he's gone. They're dealing with that deflated feeling. And then just those specific members get another video link. This video is like (sighs) Christmas themed. There's Christmas music playing. And the individual in it is wearing a Santa hat and playing with another kitten. Same thing, getting the kitten all excited. It's pawing this like little ball. And then... As you're looking around in the video, you notice there's a python in the background. Uh, I'm just going to say again, I, I haven't seen the full video, didn't watch past that point of, of the python becoming in frame in the documentary, so I don't know how much they show on there. But you can basically come to the conclusion of what is going to happen when a python has a little kitten put in front of it. So now they are even more angry, distraught, upset. And around this time, they tracked Luca in England. There was a reporter in England who started getting wind of um, what was going on and was able to lock down an interview. And of course, in this interview, Luca is, he's denying everything. He's saying that somebody out there is framing him doesn't know who and doesn't know why he would be framed (laughs) kind of makes sense that like they're like who is this person with fan accounts you just came out of nowhere and so the reporter knows that and is not buying it and and it's kind of like showing that in their the interview isn't really entertaining too too much so not long after this interview the the reporter receives an email and this guy takes it as you know it's intended to throw him off it says I love that you have no idea who I am. You're looking in the wrong direction. You're, you know, having interviews with the wrong people. And what I have planned next is far worse than what has happened so far. And basically says that I will be graduating from kittens to humans. Now, everybody that is interacting with each other behind the scenes who believes that, like, this is like it is Luca. It's Luca who did that, who's done everything, made the fake accounts, started leaving breadcrumbs in the groups, emailed this reporter. They're sure that it's him, but there's no way to, they don't have like a tracker on him. There's no, you know, iPhone, find my iPhone little, what are the tracker pods called? You know what I mean. When they first discovered him, he's in Toronto. Then all of a sudden they see him being interviewed in London. And then he was basically stalking some of the members within the group, sending videos of of like videotape footage of the, like of their employment place of work. What am I trying to say? I'm so heated right now. Walking around outside one of these women's works. That's what you're trying to say, Sherilyn. For shit sakes. In the states, okay. So now he's threatening these the lives of these internet detectives but where in the like how how is he how is he traveling how do you how do you keep track of somebody like this so effing creepy i i don't even know what i would do and this was one of those cases too where i kept thinking like i you know we a lot of true crime creators or people who get in in groups like that you don't think there's something like that's gonna happen you just kind of want to be involved and try to help and figure it out can you imagine this person that you were focusing on sending you a video outside of your work, just randomly walking around in the parking lot. What we know now is that Luca had eventually made his way back to Canada and moved to Montreal, where he put a ad out on Craigslist in May 2012. And it was seeking a male that would participate in a x-rated film he got a reply back from a man named june lynn who is a student at concordia university in montreal i'm i'm pretty sure my sister goes to concordia i'll have to ask her now june was not born in canada he was born in china on december 30th 1978 to his parents duran and 
Du Lin. He was the older brother to his little sister. And as far back as his family can remember, his dream was always to move to Canada. He he wanted to fulfill that dream so bad that when he was in China still, he took French lessons so that it gave him a better shot of getting approved for immigration. And he ultimately did accomplish his dreams. He moved to Canada. He enrolled in Concordia University to study computer sciences. And he worked at a convenience store to help support himself while he was going to school. Everybody who personally knew him, who worked with him, went to school with him, said that he was an extremely lovable person. He was always laughing and smiling. And just one of those people that you loved being around because you knew every time you were going to be around them, their energy was going to be like super high and they were always going to be really positive. Oftentimes, when you're new to a city and you're wanting to meet people, especially for companionship, you go to, you know, online dating or what was really popular around this time was making like an online dating profile on POF or even Craigslist. So it was on Craigslist that June saw this ad for somebody looking to participate in a a video. So he responded saying that he was interested and on May 24th, he met up with Luca Magnata. The two of them were seen on video surveillance with June meeting up with Luca and going to Luca's apartment. And that is the last footage of June alive. Then on May 25th, another video is uploaded to the internet. And something to remember about Luca, and this will kind of come into play later, is everything that he did, there's always like a breadcrumb. And this was something that the people within this group had noticed like from the get-go they had quickly come to realize that like nothing that he had put out there wasn't posted specifically to lead them like down a trail and for them to like try to solve something he's like fucking the satanic version of taylor swift so this video starts and there's music again playing in this and it's the opening credit song of american psycho and the the video camera is in a bedroom And behind the bed is this big Casablanca poster. And that's kind of like where your attention first focuses because it's like the only thing on the wall. And then you see there's a gentleman tied up on the bed. And he seems rather subdued, not struggling or anything, which would make sense if he knew like what his intention was going into things like filming a risque video. And then you see another person come into frame same like the videos of the kittens kind of like caressing and like soothing and toying with this victim getting him comfortable and then he gets on top of them and then you see what looks like an ice pick it was actually a screwdriver that was painted to look like an ice pick but something about Luca is that he one of the movies that he was obsessed with was Basic Instinct. And if you've seen that that movie, which stars Sharon Stone and Michael Douglas, you'll know that it starts off with Sharon Stone in a room and gets on top of a, a man who is tied up, kind of the same thing, toys around and then reaches for an ice pick and starts stabbing. So based on that description of the opening scene of that movie, you know what happens in this video. From what has been reported by those who actually saw the tape, this th- this assault, this murder goes on for a very long time. Like there's just no letting up even when it is very clear that June is no longer alive. It's also um, said that at this point, uh, Luca engages in sexual acts with the body. Um, this is really, really graphic. Then takes a fork and knife and like cuts pieces and invites a puppy into the frame to start eating. Like, I, what the fuck is wrong with people? I think this or this was like the second video where or case where I had come um, up with Jurassic Jail 
for good reason. If you're new here, that would mean nothing to you. But I, I, I'm i working on a passion project and it's called Jurassic Jail. And basically it is Jurassic Park, but in real life. And you know how they like dangle the lamb in Jurassic Park at the beginning and then like the Tyrannosaurus Rex goes to town on the lamb? Yeah, no, let's not, let's not use lambs. Let's use people like this. I don't see anything wrong with this. Does that make me a little bit messed up? Maybe, maybe it has. But it, when you've covered like over almost like 200 true crime cases, I think we're at like 157 right now. Anyways, this was one of the first cases where this concept came and it was like right around this point where I was just like, what, 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 what the fuck is wrong with people? What the fuck is wrong with people? The members of the Facebook group get this video and are naturally horrified, angry. They had been telling people like this is what's going to happen. Not because they guessed it because he's basically said it. He said it. He sent the fake email that said that this was going to happen. And now they are looking at a video and they know like this is this is not fake. This is real. It's not made to look, you know, super realistic for some fucked up website like this actually happened. So they send the video to the contact that they had made in in Toronto who had originally gone to that apartment building and unfortunately they don't hear anything back right away it's not until May 29th when a package containing some of June's body parts were sent to the conservative party of Canada that members of this Facebook group popped off they were like we we sent you the video didn't hear back from anybody right away. Now everyone's freaking out on the news. Like we've 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 been telling you this. Like we have the information. Just just come talk to us. So that is that's what it took. It took his body parts being sent to the conservative party. And authorities ended up reaching out to members of this group asking to, you know, like be be let in the group to go through like and actually now look at all of the evidence, see all of the clues from the get-go and start to piece things together. So these people within the group, they know him. They've been dealing with this for a while while nobody is listening and are the ones to fill in the investigators with the way Luca operates that there is nothing that's done without a purpose. So they look at the video and immediately the Casablanca photo or, or sorry, poster jumps out at them. And they're like, that's got to be a clue. And one of the famous, very famous lines in Casablanca is we will all will always have Paris. So they're like, OK, this dude is going to Paris. Sure enough, he went to Paris. And through surveillance videos, they were able to confirm that he was seen in the Paris airport um, getting in a cab. And then after that, there was no sign of him. Luckily, when investigators did get down there, they were able to locate the cab driver and find out what hotel that he uh, registered at. He used his, his own name. However, then they found out that he started using fake passports and had fled. Luckily, they were able to find out one of the names on the passport and this just further, further hammers home how calculated, twisted, effed up this guy is because the name he chose for his passport was Kirk Trammell and Trammell is the last name of Sharon Stone's character in Basic Instinct. I, I'm always like, like, I don't understand how how is that level of how do you get to that level of like insanity like that's absolutely banana like you just you take your favorite videos the, or your favorite movies and and then start putting them together and but in real life to carry out murders and fake passports and running away from the law and leaving breadcrumbs like what's wrong with just being obsessed with the movie and making a fan account for the movie instead of yourself. But then it's good that I don't know and understand because I, I don't want to be like that. So <sighs> there's a lot of breaths, a lot of breaths in this video. Okay. Thankfully, everything came to a head on June 4th when Luca walked into a cyber cafe in Berlin. And in some twist of fate, the the cafe owner was looking at a story covering Luca at that moment that he walked in. So he has his screen facing 
him and anybody walking in couldn't see so he's like looking at the screen sees Luca and then looks up and Luca is standing at his desk while he's reading about him and he's just kind of going back in mind you know back and forth in his mind like is that him is it him I don't know closes out the window helps Luca Luca luckily wanted to stick around and bought some internet time and part of the reason why the the owner was kind of unsure was because as he's looking at him he explains him as a very like shy wormy timid guy and then also in the same breath was very polite to him and he just looked at him like this guy could not have committed a murder as gruesome as you know he's being accused of or whoever the person who did it is like this guy just unfortunately might look exactly like him so he gets him all set up and then goes back to the screen still second guessing himself and he's like no it it can't be him I gotta is it him so he he decides he's got to go back for another look and like looks at like key details and as he goes back he's pretending that he's cleaning the the internet station beside where Luca is sitting and he looks over and Luca is he's reading the the same like the the articles the news reports that the the owner was reading like reading about himself in this cafe that right there I guess shows the level of like narcissism uh uh, yeah, I don't know. He, like he's in he's in public. He's on an internet cafe, just in the open, looking at looking at his mugshot and what is being written about him. So at this moment, the guy's like, "Yeah, okay, he's the one who did it." And the timing of everything got even wilder because he kind of um, he freaks out a little bit and walks out of the cafe, just kind of like, "Oh gosh, like what what am I gonna do?" And just ahead just steps away from him on that block he sees a police officer standing there and he's got a bunch of like recently graduated cadets with him so he approaches them and tells them what's you know what what's going on and who he thinks is in his cafe and there's actual surveillance footage where you see just them stroll into this place like one after one after one and arrest Luca At the time of his arrest and while authorities were trying to work out issues they were having of actually getting him back to Canada because there was no commercial plane that wanted him on the flight. Fun fact, I'm sorry you guys that I'm going to go on a tangent here. I I was not aware that that uh, they, like I don't I want I don't want to say often because I'm not like well versed I don't really know how often it happens but there are there are times where some you know criminals or somebody that's arrested or charged with something and they're in a different area and have to go back on a plane will go on a commercial flight so maybe it judges by the risk but I only found that out because I was on a flight that that had happened with and I was just like completely like in my own world getting my little iPad all set up and and big guy was like oh <laughs> that guy that guy is um he's detained and they put him at the very back and I was like how do you know and he's like, well, he was handcuffed. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, they they just put him on with us? So anyways, sorry for the interruption. That was my story. So they couldn't find um, a commercial flight that was wanting to have Luca on it. And while they're still in Europe waiting to bring him back to Canada, another two packages, June's body parts, show up in two different locations in Vancouver, One of them was at a university and another one was at an elementary school. Like there's, there is no limits. There are no limits to the pure evil of this person. Finally, on June 18th, Luca was brought back to Canada. He sits down with detectives and after a really long time of him not talking at all starts to talk and it's super cringy in the interview he portrays himself as kind of the way the cafe owner had described him like just like very meek and timid and knowing what we know about Luca like you know that it's a performance and it's a it that's embarrassing because it's a bad one he's trying to play into this this victim mode which is super super creepy and this this is a part where like like I don't know if I want to give it away in the documentary how they do it in the documentary because it's like it's so 
I guess I wouldn't really give it away. We already know the end of the, the case, but the way that you've, you've got to watch, because the way that they, they piece together the interview and like the things that he is saying, and they've edited it, and they combine scenes with basic instinct within this interview, like it's, it's insane. In this interview, while he's talking to the detectives, he's, he's sprinkling lines of Sharon Stone's lines from the movie when she's being interrogated. Like he's the own star of his own basic instinct. He's Kirk Trammell. Then he drops that this was not all him, that somebody else was involved that was forcing him and threatening his life if he didn't do these things. And he said that this person's name was Manny. And when you find out who Manny is, you're like, oh, well, <laughs> Like I said, there's there's literally no end. Just when you think like everything is is shocking enough, it's not. So Manny is the name of the boyfriend of Catherine Tremell in Basic Instinct, who she kills at the beginning of the movie. And this is where it gets even wilder because... It's not like he was just like, okay, I'm just going to come up with Manny right now or was thinking about it on the plane ride home to try to take some heat off of him and put it on something else. No. Before June was even murdered, Luca had gone to a lawyer. He went to this lawyer and claimed that he was being threatened and forced to do things that he didn't want to do and he was in danger of from this guy named Manny. And so that showed that there was, you know, like this this paper trail, this Manny trail that that was already set. This was before June had died. And that that to me to show even that piece of the layer of premeditation is just I, I don't I I can't ugh. I don't know. It's so creepy. It gives me chills. It makes me sick. Regardless of what he knew what was going to go down, it's like he knew he was going to need that trail. He knew he knew he was going to talk about this this Manny who is Sharon Stone's boyfriend at the beginning that he kills and then he had killed June that way. Like it's you oh my god. Chilling, chilling because this is real. At his trial, the evidence was indisputable based on evidence uh, collected from his apartment where he where he killed June. Um, it appeared that there was there was a wine bottle that was left, and so it appeared that Luca and June had had wine, or that he pretended to drink wine and had offered June some to you know maybe loosen up prior to making their video and this there were traces of the wine that had um, rohypnol in it which would explain why there really was not a struggle at all in the video when Luca started attacking June. Now the defense went for insanity so didn't even go the Manny route which squashes any argument there because I have seen not often, but sometimes the the argument that, okay, well, how do we know that there isn't a Manny that's just like out there living the life? And if a defense lawyer had that piece, especially in a case that had gotten this much attention, they would have used it. And I, I have full faith in those internet detectives that took Luca down that they would have found a Manny if there was a Manny. But anyways, I, I, there, I don't even think that there's an argument there because the defense would have talked about it. Instead, they went for the insanity plea. And after 12 weeks of trial and eight days of deliberation, the jury found him guilty on all counts that he was charged on. He was given a life sentence, which I know this really surprised a lot of people in the last video that I did about a Canada life sentence. It's 25 years, which means that after that, you are eligible to apply for parole. But usually when you are somebody like this, you, you, you don't get it. People like Luca Magnata, uh, Robert Picton, Paul Bernardo. We just talked about Cody Lejbikoff. These I don't see ever getting out of prison. Now, I want to mention that there were experts who uh, weighed in on the trial who said that he showed signs of schizophrenia, signs of uh, personality disorder and narcissism. We, we know that one for sure, but that those are, n that, you know, weren't 
wasn't enough argument for insanity because he was still able to know what he was doing. What he was doing was for shock value to live out some twisted fantasy. Things were extremely calculated, you know, steps ahead and not an insanity. I don't know who took over me. I don't know what happened. I'm just like roaming the streets covered in blood and I don't know why. Like that's uh, like that that's what they're talking about that like you you have a lapse in judgment you do not know you do not know what happened you went insane I, I I mean he could yeah he's I do think that he is like insane but like twisted messed up in my eyes I think that every one of those people who worked so hard to take him down are they they are G's, man. They are heroes. It's so sad. I I, I can only imagine. I'm, I'm not going to speak for them, but I can imagine um, putting myself in that situation that there would probably be some feeling of not guilt because I hope that they all know that they did like the the best that they could with what they were given and with with who would listen to them. But they because they knew like they knew what was going to happen they knew that he was never going to stop and where this was going to escalate. So in that same breath, like even though they weren't able to save June, like I hope that they know that that they saved a lot of people in my opinion because I strongly believe that he would have never stopped at just June. Like it would have it would have been horrific. Jin and his family are they they're always in my thoughts. I think a, a lot because Everything had happened in Montreal and he worked so hard to come to Canada, like the country that I live in. And after everything happened, after he was brutally murdered, his family uh, in on media, like they were always so thankful and appreciative of everything that everybody in Montreal had done for them. And they recognized that he loved Montreal so much and that he'd worked so hard to get there, to get to Canada, and he finally made it, that they didn't bring him back home. They buried him in Montreal and let him stay in the place that he had worked to get to. And like, oh my God, like I think that that is beautiful. And so heartbreaking at the same time, like that show like I don't even know that level of selflessness like to leave your son behind and allow him to rest where he probably would have wanted to even though what happened to him you know happened and that that was the place that he was taken from them I don't know it just shows like how absolutely phenomenal his family is and obviously how phenomenal of a person he would have been since he was raised by them. So the majority of my family live in Montreal and I go often, not often, I wish I go often. I, I, I'm, I'm making it a routine to now go often. There we go. I would straight up lied there for a second. But um, sorry about that, you guys. Moving forward, when we do now more more often go, he will always, always be on the forefront of my mind and I will always think about him so <sighs> lots of size today I just this case this this is why I wanted to, sh- to share this case because it's just it seems unbelievable and I think it's important to know that you don't ever want to think that somebody is out there that evil and Luca McNaught is not the only well he's only Luca McNaught but there are people out there that are like him and that scares the effing crap out of me so be safe be aware follow follow your gut instinct and um if you're an internet sleuth out there there is um there are lessons to be had with this I'm not saying like hey just like go like full-blown accusing people because I think the chances of like a lot of people in Facebook groups to ever like uncover and solve something like this ever again are very slim Although I know like a lot of people want to be a part of something like that. While I say that, let's also just not um, point fingers and just like try to make a murder out of somebody that is innocent. Okay. All right. I'm just going to stop talking. That's it for me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.